Hey, welcome to Our Defining Moments. I'm your host, Mary McClements. In this podcast, I talk with people about the split-second moments in their lives that sent them in directions that they never expected. From the woods of Vermont to the streets of San Francisco to the Camino de Santiago in Spain, you may be astonished by the chain reactions these moments have had not only for my guests, but for those around them. Hello, this is Mary McClements from Our Defining Moments. My guest today is Jen Ruddy. Jen is from Pennsylvania in the United States. She's the oldest sibling of four in her family, and she's also a twin. Jen's defining moment was something she chose to do in a moment of clarity, and one that many people wish they had the courage to do, but she actually did. I'm super psyched to talk to her today more in depthly about her defining moment and how it fits into her life today. So, hey, Jen. Hey, Mary. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for being here today. Not a problem. I like to just jump right in. I like to get to the point pretty quickly. Can you just first share who you are? Who is Jen? Who is Jen? Well, I live in Vermont with my husband and daughter who is currently overseas a dog and a cat. I work full time for a judge who is wonderful and (laughs) overall pretty happy and satisfied with life. No complaints other than that I didn't win the mega millions last night. I didn't play. Yes, I did. And I had it all spent in my head. Wasn't it like $2 billion or something? You had it all spent? It was one billion and I had it all spent and I was going to fund historically black colleges and the NAACP make people who go to prison, actually get a college degree, some of nice. them. And I love yes. that. Anyway. Oh, you have a soft um, so side to you. I do. I do. So who's Jen? I guess, I don't know. I think I'm not super complex. I'm pretty black and white. It's so interesting you brought up the black and white. I might ask you about that later. I've known you for 21 years and I've never asked you, like, who do you think you are? It's interesting to hear that from you. Okay. So I want to cut right to the chase because the topic of relationships fascinate me. And I know your defining moment is about that. Can you share your defining moment? My defining moment was when I decided to no longer speak to my mother. That's it. It was really as simple as that. How old were you when you decided this? Well, Tess was two. Tess is Um, your daughter. Yep. Okay. So now I have to do math in my head, which may not work. She's now 20. It was 18 years ago. I am 55. So I'll let you do the rest of the math. Yeah. So you were 30 something. Yes. Yeah. Give me some more details when you had this revelation and it was like, bam, I'm done. Paint me a picture of what was going on. Well, my mom was up to visit. Kevin and I, our daughter was two. And she was pretty off the wall that whole weekend she was up to visit. Mm -hmm. And she was always generally kind of off the wall. And we had gone to a picnic and given her directions or she was going to follow us to this picnic. And Mm -hmm. somehow I lost her on the way to the state park where the picnic was located. And she got really irrationally upset and finally got to the picnic. And when she got there, she was in hysterics. And pretty much thought she was going to die via deliverance and that we purposely lost her on the way to the state park, which A, we would have not ever done on purpose and B, she was not going to be raped and murdered by somebody on Mm -hmm. the way to the state park. So anyway, that was when I knew that she was just a little too crazy. I hope that's PC enough to say. She was so irrational. She was not somebody you could ever say, Mom, that's totally not true. And we never would have lost you on purpose. And all the houses you passed are filled with nice people. We know them all. She would have never. I know. It is true. There was no talking her down. There's never been any talking her down. And I had just had enough. It was not good for my family. It was not good for my daughter to see. It was not good for my relationship with Ken. And not good for me. So I was done. Yeah. And I'm still done. So many years later. So 
for most people, parent gets upset, they get irrational, and you don't cut them off. Mm-hmm. But for you, it had been a lifetime of this, right? Yes. And I yeah. had just reached my fill. I couldn't yeah. take it any longer. Can you describe your relationship with your mom when you were a kid? What was your life like with her? Well, I think there needs to be a little backstory about my mom in that she had discovered her father, who was an eye surgeon who had committed suicide at their family camp. And she was the one who found him. And she was 13. So the whole family, she had three siblings and a mom who once he died, she took every bit of memory and evidence of him out of the house and they were never allowed to say his name again. And that was the end of it. He died and he was gone. So Mm -hmm. she comes with some trauma. And so I think she had kids to, I don't know, make her feel better. So our role as her children was to always tell her how great she was, how skinny she was, how Mm -hmm. her food was super, and to agree with her. Wow. And do what she wanted. And I couldn't do that any longer. Can you give me an example of a time where she was like, okay, kids, I need you to validate me. Sure. Oh my God. This was our daily topics were usually filled with conversations like this. Kids, how do I look? Do I look great? Do I look skinny? Do I look slim? Do I look fat? Do I look beautiful? If we said skinny, but she really wanted us to say thin, then we were like, oh, fart. We said the wrong one because she'd get upset because we didn't say the right word to describe her. If you said the wrong word, what would her reaction be? I can't believe you don't think I'm not thin. What do you mean I'm just skinny? That was it. She always wanted really pretty kids, really skinny kids, really smart kids who were going to go and do great things and make her seem like the best parent in the world. None of us ever met those expectations. Ever. Yeah, I can't imagine. This was emotional abuse, in my opinion, and it's so similar to physical abuse or waiting for the next shoe to drop, always waiting for the next thing that you're going to do wrong and that person's going to explode. And I can't imagine how challenging that was as a kid. And I'm assuming that it affected your siblings also. You're the oldest of four and you have a twin sister who's a few minutes younger than you. And so I assume it affected them too and probably differently. Yeah, I mean, I think it affected all of us. Fortunately, we were all smart enough to realize the less time we spent in the house, the better off we were. As kids, we were all pretty super tight and looked out for each other. We all knew enough to go to our friends' houses. I fortunately had parents of friends who, when I think back on my childhood, that kind of stuff my mom did bothers me a ton, but I also feel like I had a pretty fun childhood just because Mm. we all knew enough to get the hell out of the house. And we were gone from sunup to sundown. You're here to the 70s and 80s. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. We knew enough. By the time we were like five, I think we all knew how and when to speak and Mm, be present in the house. Oh yeah, totally. Was there a time that you started to realize that being in a relationship with your mom was not a good idea? I know that it wasn't at that moment when she was irrational about not getting to the picnic quickly or losing you. Was there another time when you were younger that you considered like, I don't think this is good for me? Yeah, I would say teenage years. Mm -hmm. I would think probably in my early teens, I knew. But uh, I think at that time, my parents were going through a divorce. I still needed to financially rely on some people. I had by my late teens, moved out. So I had already taken that step. Um, So yeah, I mean, I was kind of in more control of when I talked to her or didn't talk to her. Do you know what I mean? Right. So that was helpful. I think it really hit home though when I finally had tests. I would talk to my mom and be a mess for days after. And I was like, I can't do this anymore to my family. That's my next question is, in what ways did ending your relationship with your mom, how did it affect your family or people around you making that choice? I think Ken was probably very glad. Your husband? Um, Yep. And I think what it did was show both my daughter and Ken that 
family is really who you make it. Family mm-hmm. doesn't have to be family. And I've always felt very strongly about that. And I think it's because I had other people in my life who really cared for me better than my family. I think you just have to have the courage. You can't have somebody, uh, can I curse? Of course you can. Like you can't have somebody fuck with your mind because you know she is a victim of trauma and she was not going to get better. She wasn't Mm -hmm. interested in getting better, but I could still take care of myself and get better. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was actually a kind of an easy decision to make and I don't regret it to this day. This is so fascinating to me because most people I know have trauma, different types of trauma, different things have happened to them. And people can make a choice to heal themselves. And for some people, it's just so enormous that they don't see any way out of their either trauma reactions or how it affects their day to day. Earlier on, you said you're very black and white. And so you have this ability to be like, nope, I'm done. And cutting your mom off ending your relationship with your mom wasn't the only time that you had a split second decision about cutting someone off. Yeah. Yeah. So it's something that I see it as such a strength. Of, oh, huh. <laughs> do you want to mention who the other person was? I know this is out uh, of left field. I'm trying to think who was the other person. Oh, your first husband. Oh, well, that was super easy. <laughs> for you, but not for yeah. so many other people. Oh. Weren't you at like a county fair or something and he tripped you yeah, and you were and like, I'm done. Me. And that yeah. was it. Yeah, I was done. Yeah. But he'd also spent the first year of our marriage drinking <sighs> and being abusive. And I'd have to hide in the bedroom because he was such a shit. So it was just like the icing on the cake. What do you think gives you the strength or the fortitude or the black and whiteness to be like, I'm done? Well, and- I think we all have that. But I think that there's so many people who are like, were you ever in a bad job and knew it was so bad for you? Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, yes. I know you know that, right? So how many people feel like, why do we feel like we need to suffer? Mm, a lot, most. I know, but why? Yeah. I mean, look what happened. I left him and yeah. found Ken, this amazing guy. We all have, you know, with some issues, but my God, I never thought I'd be where I am now. I just know with myself that if I don't have the courage to make some of these changes, then I feel it physically. Mm. I mean, when I was with Tim, I gained like 25 pounds. Yeah, right. Because I ate myself silly. Yeah. And when I left um, the really shitty job, I lost like 15 pounds. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Like, why must we stay? I don't know. Maybe my like fill up level is a little less tolerant than most people, but I just get to a point where I'm like, fuck it. I'd rather be on the street. I'd yeah. rather be anywhere but here. Yeah. And I got to do it. Do you ever think or question, like, what if she or I had made different choices about our relationship? Like, if she were able to change a little bit and you hadn't cut her off, do you ever think about what your relationship would be like today? No. No. It was one no. and done. Like, bing, bam, boom. We're done. Yeah. So, and I don't wish her any ill will. I mean, no, I'm sure it's super hard. Well, that's good because most people would. (laughs) No, I don't. I don't. She's also made some choices, right? And not worked on stuff like she should have. And this is the outcome. Or maybe she couldn't work on stuff. My God, like I've never gone through what she went through. And I think that had to have been horrible. Yeah. And there's this. Funny dichotomy, I'll just say, of her finding her father after he took his life, after he died, and you cutting it off, which is also like a death. It's like, I just find that really interesting. Is there anything you can say about that? Any thoughts on that? No, no. I mean, it's (laughs) sad for sure. And I've never thought about it that way. It's very sad. That's all I can say. And But even thinking about it that way, She might even think about it that way. I still can't do it. So I'm going to bring something different in. So there's a certain amount of control that you like to have in your life. And (laughs) yeah, and there have been times where I'm like, oh, it's the agenda. My son actually said, got to be Jen's way. Not always, but the agenda. So there's a certain amount of control that you like to have in your life. And my guess is that it partially comes from being in a pretty chaotic family And the fact that you lived in West Philly in the 80s, where your family was by far the minority. 
right? And yeah. you had to be emotionally and physically tough to get through the day. Do you think this time in your life helped or hindered you when it comes to relationships? You oh. need a certain amount of control. Yes, and I'll always need it. And I think it was because our life was so chaotic. Totally. And the West Philly thing, I loved living there. I'll tell you, the streets were our comfort places. The scary place was school because we went to a Catholic school where the nuns beat the shit out of us. And I was locked in a closet day after day because I was always pretty stubborn and wouldn't follow. I wasn't a rule follower, but yet I like rules because Mm -hmm. they're so black and white. But growing up, I was not a rule follower at all. It wasn't where you lived. It was going to Catholic school where you had to be emotionally and physically tough because I'm guessing back in the day, the sisters still used rulers to hit kids. Oh my God, totally. So do you Um, think that time has hindered or helped when it comes to your relationships? I think it depends on who you ask. I think the people who are... I know. Well, I think the people who are in relationships with me now are the ones who are left standing, who are okay if I'm a little controlling. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I try to be less controlling, but does it help or hinder? I think it is what it is. And the friends left standing are the ones who kind of get me. Is it the same for your family members? Like the family members who... You know, like you had to take control of your relationship with your mom and you decided to cut it off. Same with your ex-husband. I guess the connection, I'm wondering if there is a connection that black and white because of your whatever, having to be resilient. If you think that has helped you get out of these relationships that were utterly toxic for you. Oh, totally. Yes. Especially with COVID and the crap that's happened over the last couple of years. I really feel like I don't have the energy for people who like suck a lot of shit out of me. Mm, Yeah, And I mean, it's amazing how less willing I've been getting over the years. I'm feeling old. I'm going to have a good time. Yeah. And be happy. Yeah. Right. That's the beauty of being in your 50s. It's like, we don't give a fuck as much, which is so nice. Yeah. So how do you think your daughter perceives this decision you made. And do you think it's helped her in life? I think it has helped her. I think it's helped her understand it's good to have a voice and it's good to look out for yourself and it's good to do what's necessary to keep yourself safe. Mm. So I do think it's helped her. She's certainly spent enough time with family members on the other side of the family that are pretty hard to deal with and traumatizing. And I think she understands needing to separate yourself to keep yourself safe. I totally think she gets that. Like I do think about, well, what if she decides not to talk to me anymore? I think about that quite a bit and I'd be heartbroken and I hope it doesn't happen. But I also think my mom wasn't that heartbroken. I don't think she had the capacity to understand why because she never thought she did anything wrong. I think that if I had an inkling that my daughter was like, I am not talking to you anymore, I'd be like, okay, we're going to figure this out. We're going to talk about, you know what I mean? We're going to talk about it. Yeah. Um, And I think that you and your daughter have the ability to be rational and to talk to each other. Like if she came to you and said, mom, I want to have a relationship with you, but it's not going to be on your terms. It's not going to be how you want it. That you two would have the ability to discuss it and be reflective and not get defensive. Whereas I don't think that you had that opportunity with your mom. Like there was not going to be, and you knew this from your history with her, there wasn't going to be a discussion on how can we improve this. Right. So yeah, no, I think my daughter, I think she thinks it's a good thing. I really do. And I think she's learned that The only one responsible for you is you. I hope she has. I don't know. (laughs) You'll have to ask her. (laughs) But I hope that's what the takeaway is. Yeah, it's a certain type of modeling. Okay. Yeah. This might be one of my last questions. And it's hypothetical. So what if there were someone listening to this podcast who is in a toxic relationship with a family member or really anyone, and they've dreamed about cutting it off for years, but they haven't been able to? What might you say to them? Think about why they're still in it. 
So maybe if my mom was a gazillionaire and I knew I was going to get money, I might have stayed in it. Um, (laughs) But I I probably would not have because I'm that stubborn. But think about... Is it stubborn or is it survival? For me, I think it's survival. I just couldn't do it. You've got to be getting something out of it. What are you getting out of it? There's got to be something. There's got to be some outcome from it because otherwise then you're lying to yourself. Like if it's so toxic and so bad for you, would you stay with a friend who was that bad? The person's got to be getting something out of it. Yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to the need to survive. Like this ingrained biological belief that if I, not even belief, subconscious feeling that if I cut off these people who have always been in my life, who were my caregivers, who are part of my clan, then I might die. And I think it's so deep in our biology. I don't agree with that. (laughs) Oh, tell me more. I don't think that just because someone birthed me didn't mean they had the best outcome for me in their plan. I just feel like there are great parents and then there are really shitty parents. There are people who don't look out for their children. And... I wish I could be more articulate, but I can't. No, I understand. Um, I think what you're saying is what you would say to somebody who wanted to make a similar choice was, what are you actually getting out of it? Is it positive? Is it all negative? And what might they do? Right. Why do you have to have this loyalty to people who treat you like shit? I don't get it. Yeah. It's part of your black and white thinking that I think has helped you survive in many ways. Yeah. And it works for you. might not work for somebody else. Right. It does work for me. And it has worked for me. I've never thought differently. Like Mm -hmm. even if I was, I don't know. I mean, I've just always thought things are going to work out. And they have worked out. Well, again, I feel as though so many folks have relationships with family members or spouses, partners, that they want to cut it off. And it's just so hard to... And your defining moment of when your mom showed up at the picnic and, you know, was kind of off the rails of you in that moment saying, I'm done, is not a common thing. And the fact that you've stuck with it. Yeah. And maybe it's because I always feel like I have to keep myself safe. Mm, Yeah, it's understandable. All right. So any last parting words of wisdom or anything else you want to say? No, I mean, just do it. Like that Nike commercial. You never know until you try. If you're really in that much of a pickle in a relationship and need to get out, just mm. do it. Really, it's easy really for you to say. It is easy for me to say, but I feel like I have done it. When I left him, I packed up my car, never looked back. Jen, well, thank you so much for being here and sharing your defining moment. I think you're so brave. Oh, and thank you. I hope that this decision continues to be the best one for you throughout your life. I hope so. And if it changes, things change. So let me know. know, I'll let you know. Yes. So this has been Our Defining Moments. I'm Mary McClements. Stay tuned for next week's episode on a whole other story. This has been Our Defining Moments with Mary McClements. I'm back next week with more stories of moments in time that change someone's life forever. Please rate and review the show and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 